I'll do the obligatory recap. This is actually a talk which is um, rather long, uh, much longer than 45 minutes, so I might end up not doing the, the end of it. So essentially, uh, the, the whole thing, the whole design patterns panacea, or the design pattern silver bullet, it, uh, it got started a long time ago, and the examples were actually in C++, although of course that would be a rather old variety of C++. And, and back sort of 10, 15 years ago, uh, you, if you wanted a job, and I was an undergrad, I wanted a job, you had to know patterns because it was like a must-have thing. It's, it's no longer the case, I don't think, although it, at a certain level people just assume that you, that you know how to use and misuse those. Uh, the patterns that were presented in the book, they got translated to all the other OOP languages and, and even some crazy languages like JavaScript, which I don't know if they are OOP or not, but anyways, it became a, a kind of global phenomenon. And so um, uh, the patterns, not only did they, uh, not only were they translated to other languages, but they were internalized in some languages, meaning that, for example, in, in something like C Sharp, they basically took the observer pattern and they say, well, let's make it part of the language, let's see how that goes. Uh, and C++ has done none of those things. So in C++, you might argue that why are we here in this back to the 90s talk, given that uh, no patterns were really incorporated into the language to, to change anything. But then again, it's, it's interesting just to discuss what's going on. And uh, I certainly uh, have, uh, well, as I, was, uh, as I was building my own understanding of patterns, I, I had a lot of uh, kind of refer references to other programming languages and how it's done there. So there's going to be some nitpicking of C++ in the standard library in, in this talk as well. So <clears throat> basically, I, I just want to show a bunch of examples. There is no particular structure here. It's, I mean, this talk is part of a larger talk, which is part of like maybe 20 hours worth of videos or something to that effect. So I'll go through some of the patterns, maybe not all of them. Maybe I won't go through the maybe. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll try to get through some of them and look uh, why are they relevant, what, what's going on there. So um, uh, code, uh, just, just a typical disclaimer, uh, suboptimal code, I, <laughs> uh, I just, just do this for brevity. I think everybody uh, in their talks <laughs> said, oh, you know, I cut this because there isn't enough space. So it's a, it's a similar thing here. I might also include some non-standard code. It's very difficult for me to detect non-standard code because so much stuff compiles in Visual Studio, which really shouldn't. Uh, and um, uh, so, but nothing, nothing particularly evil. So uh, uh, one thing that we've heard about uh, on this conference, at least two talks I've heard, that people have their own string classes. And the question is, well, why do they have their own string classes? Well, the answer is that the, uh, the STL uh, string class is pretty evil. So, I mean, it, it, it starts okay, you, you, you make a string and, and everything is fine, but then maybe you want to split a string on a space. You want to get the separate words. And if you are in any other programming language of note, like C Sharp, Java, whatever, you have a function called split, which you just say string.split, there you go. In, in, uh, in the uh, standard library, there's no such thing. So you, you go to Stack Overflow, you go look for something which is similar, and you find boost split, which does what you want. I mean, admittedly, it's, it's OK. But the, the thing about why are we building an adapter here is that the interface is kind of evil, uh, in that I would prefer to just have a single line saying auto parts equals s dot split. That's it. That's what I would prefer. And similarly, like if I had lots of spaces, I would maybe want to have my adapter that's opinionated. So uh, with, with the default implementation right now, I would have hello and well, then I would have lots of empty strings in between. So it wouldn't be a vector of size two, it would be a vector of size, I don't know how much. And that's not nice. That's something that I, uh, maybe it's okay to have in the library, but I have my own opinions about getting rid of the, the empty spaces. So maybe I want to incorporate that into my uh, string as well, and maybe some of the other goodies. And that doesn't just uh, imply adding stuff to the interface. It also implies getting rid of stuff from the interface. So a good example is uh, size versus length. So I mean, we're, we're all okay with it. We know that they're equivalent, but if you take somebody from the street or like a beginning junior developer or something, and you ask them, well, I have a string class and I have both size and length. Can you guess what they mean? 
I'm pretty sure that the guess would be something like, well, size is probably the number of bytes and length is the number of characters or Unicode code points, something to that effect. Then it's wrong. So, so my, uh, I guess, uh, once again, this is very opinionated, but I'm saying that let's hide size. I know size is kind of essential. It's in lots of containers. It's a normal thing, but I am totally okay with not having it. On the other hand, uh, maybe I want to have length, and once again, this is this is even more nitpicking, and maybe non-standard C++ nitpicking because I would say that length is, you know, having it as a function. Okay, well we're all used to it, but I can actually get away with having it as a, well, a field-like construct, a property. We'll see that in a moment. Uh, so uh, this this is a very trivial, silly, and you know contrived example. I have my own string. It takes an ordinary string or a const char point or whatever, and then I want to have a split function which is actually part of the interface. And, and the reason why I want this is because when I make the string with a capital S and I press the dot, I want my IDE to give me a code completion list which has split in it so that I know how to use it. It, it kind of makes sense. So here I'm just reusing some of the stuff from boost. Of course, I don't have to return a vector of small string. I can return a vector of capital S string. A bit more complicated, but, but same idea. So it's just a convenience thing. And maybe I want length as well, but I'll do it differently. I'll get, I'll get a get length instead. And the reason is that, um, once again, I think that if you have a function, that function should, you know, exhibit behavior, it should say something that we are doing. Like, we're not just length, we're getting the length. And there is an additional trick that I would do, which is totally non-standard, which is, or non-portable, uh, which is to, to effectively turn it into a field-like construct. It's a property. Uh, we actually, I think, more compilers than just MSVC and Intel support this, but I don't know which ones. But essentially, what, what this lets you do is, uh, well, there are two advantages. One is you can uh, just uh, write a string has s.length characters. And you also, if you look at the top right in the code completion list, it's kind of, uh, you, get, you get the element in code completion, at least in Visual Studio. So um, the, the whole point of the building an adapter for something is that uh, you basically take the, the objects that you can work with, but you don't like their interface. You can aggregate them, keep them as a reference, whatever. And then, uh, well, you can, you can actually stick more than one in if you want. And then you take the APIs that you want, and you can transform them like I did. Uh, there's unfortunately no tools for uh, generating those proxying functions, but maybe we'll make them someday. And you can miss out on the APIs that you don't need, and that should explain why we didn't just inherit. Because if we inherited from uh, from string, we would have the code completion list wouldn't be this tiny list here. It would have a huge amount of baggage. And if you didn't want that, you would have to somehow hide it. I don't know. It's just just simpler this way. So th it it does it does have a cost, obviously, the cost of calling through this this particular wrapper. But uh, the end result is you know you have some features that you've kind of taken from the object you're adapting. You threw some stuff out, and then you add your own features so that the string behaves how you want. And that's, that's I guess, that's what other people do as well when they have their own uh, string implementations. All right, let's try something else, uh, composite. So I know uh, nowadays machine learning is all the rage, and some people say that machine learning is just neural networks kind of repackaged again to, to make them be sexy or whatnot. So I thought this example is, is good for, for illustrating what composite is all about. So essentially we have uh, these circles are modeling neurons in your brain, whatever, and then you have uh, a simplified construct called a neuron layer, which is just a bunch of them, like, like several that you construct uh, at the same time, maybe. And, and the, the two constructs, they need to be connected. So you might want to connect like a neuron to another neuron. That's what the arrows do. But maybe you want to connect like a layer to another layer. And you want an API for this that's, that's friendly and usable and whatever. And it's difficult. Uh, so neuron might be something like this. It so it's, a, it, it's just a struct which has a vector of pointers for the in and out. So it's a doubly linked list. And then you have a neuron layer, which may as well inherit from a vector of neurons and just 
you know, stick a bunch of neurons into the into itself, effectively. Uh, so the the problem here is that we now have two constructs, and even though we can write a connecting function from one neuron to another, that's easy. The problem is that we have two classes of objects, and uh, it looks like we need four functions, unless we turn to some template magic or other, because uh, you need to connect neurons to neurons, neurons to neuron layers, and so on and so forth. And that's only if you have uh, two constructs. If you have three, that's going to be nine different functions that you need, and of course, writing them is painful. So. Um, uh, a a cop-out solution, I guess, is if you just treat a neuron as a neuron layer of size 1, uh, it's not strictly correct and it's kind of, uh, it doesn't take into account the fact that later on you might have additional layer concepts like a neuron ring or whatever. So uh, y it wouldn't be a very generic solution, but it would work. You could just say a neuron is a, a neuron layer of size 1. But uh, uh, an, an alternative is to try to somehow expose a uh, neuron as a scalar entity, expose it in an iterable fashion. And I'll explain what I mean by iterable. So if we look at other programming languages, and I refer to other programming languages quite a bit, other programming languages have specific interfaces that you would implement if you are, if you are a collection, if you're yielding lots of items. So essentially it's kind of like a, a forward iterator or something equivalent, uh, but it's a a uh, well-defined interface. It's Think of it as something that you would uh, have to implement and it would have functions that you'd have to do to uh, actually return the contents. And in the case of a single neuron, it could just try and return this. Uh, unfortunately, the, the way it works with C++ is something like duck typing. So if you want a range-based for loop, basically the, the compiler is just going to look for a begin and end pair. And that's okay, that's something that we can work with. We, we don't have a, uh, you know, any kind of enumerable interface, but we do have uh, something that, uh, that we can try to implement. So uh, let's, let's start by, first of all, uh, adding uh, a bit of templating. I, I promise there won't be any complicated templating, but the first function for connecting a neuron to a neuron becomes a specialization. Something tells me this, this code is MSVC only. I'm not sure you can even stick template specializations into like the body bit. Anyways, so you have the previous implementation now specialized. And then you have something uh, of a general implementation. So uh, we now say that the neuron can connect to an object of type T and we just use A4 for getting every element of other and we call the connect to which calls this one, hopefully. Uh, and this covers three out of the four cases actually. So for, for the neuron layer, actually no, that, that was two of the four cases. For a neuron layer, things are, di things are rather easy because uh, we have a, uh, a template function which, once again, you iterate every neuron in this layer, you iterate every neuron in whatever the other object is, and you connect to that object, hopefully calling that specialization again. But there is a problem, because what if other is just a single neuron? then calling for neuron in neuron is kind of weird. Uh, but you can actually uh, mas massage the neuron into uh, doing exactly that. So uh, very evil looking code, you basically just do a begin and end. So you return <laughs> this and this plus one. Uh, th this might seem a bit dodgy, maybe, maybe some of you see potential problems with it, but, but it does work. Uh, and, and it does kind of effectively leverage this idea of duct typing. So yeah, it's a single object, but uh, the, the composite design pattern is all about treating scalar and vector objects similarly. So that's what I'm exploiting here. So the API usage is fairly obvious. Neuron to neuron is fine. Uh, neuron to a neuron layer, we use the uh, the, the template function in the neuron, and, and here is the, the tricky stuff that we actually did the begin and end for. All right, uh, let's try something different. This isn't a gag of four stuff, but uh, equally interesting, and also a bit of a projection from, once again, other 
programming languages other uh, kind of ideas. So we have something called the open close principle, which basically says, like, uh, if you've got code that's already written and tested, don't, don't dig into it and try to modify it. In fact, when we looked at those uh, boost global functions for, like, splitting, for example, uh, that, that was a good illustration of the open close principle because uh, boost didn't take basic string, jump into it, and start modifying code. I mean, we know it's impossible or very difficult to do, but it didn't do it. Instead, it did a global. It did a global function, which is okay because it, it doesn't break the open close principle, so it doesn't try jumping into old code. It kind of adds something on the side. The, the terrible thing about this, though, is discoverability. And again, I work for a tool maker. We make IDEs. So the question is, how are people going to know that a split function is even there? Uh, unless we, if we didn't build an adapter which had that, you know, you press a dot on the string and it has the split, you wouldn't know. You would have to go to Stack Overflow and it would tell you, yeah, it's in Boost, go get it. But from the perspective of uh, code completion, it's, it's very difficult. You couldn't even make an argument that, well, one argument could go something like this. Okay, how about this? Uh, whenever you have a uh, standard string, std string, if somebody puts a dot after it, why don't we go search for every single function which takes uh, a string as the first argument, for example? Uh, apart from the fact that this is a completely unworkable solution because you would end up, I don't know, indexing all of Boost in the IDE, uh, there is an additional problem that the split function doesn't take a uh, string as the first parameter, it takes it as a second, so that wouldn't work anyway. But anyways, uh, the open close principle has been upheld there, and I want to show another example where it kind of makes sense to some degree. Okay, so very simple scenario. We have a product with a color and a size, and we want to write some code for actually uh, filtering. Uh, l l let's say we have a vector of these product pointers, and we want to find the product by a certain criteria. So a very naive solution would be something like a product filter, which uh, gets you a set of, gets you a vector of product pointers, and we have the first implementation, which filters by color. So you get the items, you get the color, you go through each of the items, if the color matches, you add the result, you return that. So, <coughs> uh, this is simple, but uh, then your boss or somebody, they say, oh, by the way, let's do it for size as well. So you do another thing, which is kind of very similar, and you, uh, once again, return items by size, but then of course you want more, you want to filter by color and size. So you can see how this becomes unwieldy, and once again this is kind of the, the, uh, the state space explosion problem. And some of you might say, well, let's just stick a predicate in here and be done with it. Somewhere there's going to be a predicate and we're going to filter by that predicate. However, that doesn't always work, like for example, if you have, uh, uh, in, in this product we had uh, the, the color and the size, but we also had a name. And maybe names exist in some database index, which would require some special kind of access. So you wouldn't implement this through a predicate. You would do something optimized on a GPU or a Xeon file. I don't know, whatever. So in this case, uh, that would be uh, the motivation for doing this kind of stuff. So let's see how we can, uh, once again, on, on the one hand, we'll increase the, the level of ceremony. On the other hand, we'll try to uh, make it more general. Because this thing is breaking uh, the open close principle, it, every time you want to add a new filter, you have to jump into existing code and modify something, which is not a good idea. So, uh, and we're making the assumption this is even possible. So we do have the access to the source code. We can get into it. In the case of like the boost uh, split function, for example, that's not an option. Boost isn't going to jump into the standard library, I don't think. So anyways, this, uh, uh, this construct isn't really flexible enough. Anytime you need a new criteria, you end up making another function, and you have to test the function. It's, it's all fairly complicated. And of course, uh, if we filter by x or y or x and y, this requires three functions, but if we had more criteria, then this would just explode, and we wouldn't be able to really write all those functions anyway. So the specification pattern tries to uh, abstract away as much of this as possible. So essentially, we have two ideas. We have a specification and a filter. So a, both of these are prim really primitive ideas, by the way. So a specification is just a, an interface that somebody would implement for a given item, and it would check whether the item satisfies some criterion. The criterion would actually be implemented in whoever implements my specification. And similarly, the idea of filtering is uh, you would have a filter interface which returns a vector of, we may as well make it, uh, make it a template, so we have 
T where T can be product of something else and we take a bunch of items and we also instead of taking a color or a size we take an I specification. So how would this work with our previous example? Well uh, we would do a different filter which would be an I filter of product so T becomes product. We take an I specification of product as well as a bunch of items and then uh, we perform pretty much a similar thing. So we go through each of the items, we check whether the specification is satisfied. So at the moment, uh, this feels very much like a predicate. I know I, I kind of said that uh, there are reasons for not having a predicate, but I'm deliberately simplifying this because the idea is that uh, later on you might have uh, you, you, you might have a specialization of this, so, so you can templatize it even further and have a specialization where uh, you know the, the a particular specification would go off and do a, a particular search. Now you can do that. Now you can, uh, you can you can also fiddle around with these filters in terms of dependency ejection. Like uh, when you are uh, testing, you can stick a different filter in, for example. So uh, specifications are now easy because you make a nice specification which has to do an is satisfied, and for each of those, it would just check the uh, check the item that's being provided against color or size or whatever. The only uh, question that's remaining, well let's, let's take a look at how it's used first of all. So you have a bunch of products, uh, make a vector of pointers, uh, now there is no ceremony. You cannot just say product filter colon colon filter stuff. You make a filter, you make a specification, you filter with all the items with the specification that we made and then you can iterate on the items. So it has become a bit more complicated, but it's become a lot more flexible. And we'll see a, another improvement in just a moment. Because uh, one question we didn't answer is what happens to filtering on more than one criteria? Not just on size or on uh, color, but on size and color, for example. So uh, in this case, what we can do is well, we certainly don't want a size and color specification. That gets us to the problems that we had before. because. Uh, it, it would just grow out of control. So instead, what we can do is we can create combinators. So we cr can create something called an AND specification, which would just combine two existing ones. So <coughs> you could do something like this, for example. So it's also a nice specification of T, completely legit to feed this into the, into the product filter. And we have the uh, constructor which takes two specifications and it checks that both of them are satisfied. That's it. And it, it does add, of course, it does add to the ceremony in the sense that if you want to use this approach, then you have to you make a product filter, you make a color specification, you make a size specification, you add them in this construct, and then you use that green and big, the, the sort of combined specification for the search. So we did add a bit of complexity, but uh, also some advantages. Like, for example, you now have a bunch of interfaces. And if you're using an IDE as opposed to Notepad, you can actually go and look for all the implementers of the interface and you can see what kind of filters you've actually implemented and what, what, how, what's, what's special about them. So essentially this thing uh, also illustrates that instead of jumping back into an existing product filter and adding more stuff on top, we can just use inheritance. We can just use object-oriented constructs and, and build on top of it so somewhere in some other library you can make more specifications and you know they, they would just need the, the base interfaces and that's, that's pretty much it. So um, I'll skip the summary of fairly obvious stuff. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at something else. Um, many uh, programming languages nowadays they uh, like uh, when they do a 1.0 they show you how cool it is how, how well they can build DSLs in all sorts of wonderful ways. And, and we have, uh, I mean in C++ we also have uh, some tricks up our sleeve for actually building certain constructs. But I'll start with ordinary builders and then move on to the kind of uh, uh, cool looking groovy style builders. So essentially if you're building something like an HTML web page which is structured and formalized and it has a certain amount of rules, like you can't put a paragraph inside a paragraph for example, then uh, you might want to uh, construct uh, an API for, for actually building those. And suddenly you can just use a string. That's, that's easy. Just, just append everything and you know, be done with it. 
I'm just doing a list of hello and world. Uh, uh, nothing bigger would fit on the screen. But you, the, the, the first tendency in object-oriented programming is to <laughs> you know, create objects so that we can uh, at some point just do a dot .str and get the pretty print. So you maybe create an HTML element which has a name, a text, a bunch of children, some indentation, and there's some pretty printing function which would uh, let's say if, if this is a web server, it would just push it to the client or something to that effect. Um, so now you can construct a builder which actually helps you uh, define HTML elements. So essentially, you can, uh, for example, in, the, in this builder you have a root element. Uh, you just specify the name and that element gets initialized. And if you want a couple of children with some name and some text, then you just have them uh, have them in a... Uh, in the in the elements of the root, and you have some pretty printing on that as well. So, uh, so now you can do something like this, which uh, somewhat some something of an improvement. At least now you can, for example, if you have uh, an array of strings, for example, you can go through each one of them and just call builder that child. One thing we do with builders, though, is we make uh, interfaces fluent, which means instead of being void, uh, you can make these functions return uh, reference to self or a, just, just a pointer to this, and the end result is that you can chain these goals, like so. And in fact, if you look at uh, builders and to some extent factories, you'll see a lot of this stuff. Because uh, people like this idea of uh, chaining, uh, chaining calls to, to actually initialize a complicated object. Um, <coughs> so uh, you, you can put some, some improvements on top of it, like you can stick the, the builder inside uh, the actual element, you can hide the constructor, you can say, oh, we'll have a static function which actually initializes the builder and returns that, and that way you can say HTML builder build, and this, this actually communicates intent rather well if you hide the constructor, because then there is no other way to construct an object and people start looking for some, some piece of API to call to actually get the process started. So Groovy style builders, uh, uh, is an idea to, to express HTML even better in code without all the ceremony of actually calling functions and having the dot operator and whatever. And uh, the idea here is to just hide the visible function calls and have something like this. And amazingly enough, this is valid because uniform initialization and all that, we can actually construct. Uh, and it's not, just, it's not just the API that, that lets you have all these curly braces. It's the fact that uh, you know, these things are being passed into the constructor of this and it can check whether they're the correct type. So a sticking a list into a list will not work. You can actually enforce these rules just by, uh, by virtue of object orientation, once again. Uh, so uh, I, I'll just go through this quickly so, so you can make a tag, and then you can have a tag with different constructors, like you can have a name in text, or you can have a name in a bunch of children. And then what you can do is you can uh, specialize. So you can say, let's have a paragraph. A paragraph is a tag, but it has uh, this specific constructor which just takes a text and it assigns the text. Alternatively, if somebody's putting, let's say, a bunch of images or something in a paragraph, then you can take them as an initializer list and then stick them into the vector that we had previously. And the same goes for the image, except for the image you can't stick stuff into it, but you have to provide a URL to where the image is. So in this case what happens is we add an attribute, once again this is a piece of magic here, adding an attribute called IMG and uh, having the having just just making a pair with SRC equals whatever the person passed. So there is no other option of using this API. And the consequence is that uh, you can do something like this. So you can make a paragraph with an image in it. So very uh, pretty, very groovy-like or Kotlin-like, but it's also very simple and it just works. All right. Uh, I'll Try to skip through this quickly. So, so far I've shown a builder which just uh, constructs uh, the object kind of wholesale. But sometimes the object you're building up is so complicated that uh, you might want to have several builders taking care of several parts of that object. So uh, I actually have a uh, reasonably simple example. Uh, so let's say that we have a uh, person class which has address information and employment information. Let's suppose that you, these things are complicated and you want separate builders for both of them, but you still want to have one fluent invocation for the whole thing, and you want the API to look good to the user. So the way you do it is uh, you need several builders. But you can actually do a trick. So <coughs> this is the person who's got some address, some employment information, 
uh, maybe hide the constructor once again so that people know how uh, that they shouldn't be calling it that's optional. Anyways, you have this top level builder. So a top level builder is a bit more complicated than a typical builder because it has the object it's building up, but it also has a reference to that object for some reason, and it has uh, a, kind, uh, a bunch of uh, different sub builders which are returned through appropriate functions. So far, it looks weird. Like, why would we have uh, two? Uh, to construct us here. And also, uh, I guess, instead of person, you can think of a unique PTR of person or something like that. doesn't really matter. So what we can do with this person builder is we can provide sub-builders. But we do want the sub-builders to allow us to jump from one sub-builder to another. So instead of just having them separate, we'll have them inherit from person builder, which explains why the extra constructors. So uh, this is the implementation of lives and works. So you make a person address builder passing a reference to whatever you're building up. And the same goes for works. You make a person job builder passing that reference. And then uh, the address builder, notice in bold, it actually inherits from person builder, which means it has lives and works functions as well as the functions we specify. So I can say a person dot lives dot add at this address with postcode so and so in such and such and city, and at any time I can jump to the other builder. So job builder. Same idea. Person works at such and such company name as a position earning however much. So if we uh, go back to person, of course we have to make some concessions. We have to uh, maybe yield the, uh, the builder somehow so that people know how to create it and also have a bunch of friend classes because those builders, they actually change Maybe they change private state. Maybe you deal with it with getters and setters. And here's the end result. So uh, <coughs> we create a person. We says that the person lives. Uh, at the end of the invocation of lives, we now have reference to a uh, person address builder. And the person address builder has at with an in. So we do those. But at any, at any time, because that class actually inherits from the person builder, it has both lives and works. So we can call works, and we jump to the other builder. And then we'll build up the rest of the object. So that's uh, builder facets, I guess you can call them. All right, I think we still have some time. Let's do a final example. So uh, this is a functional pattern. Mo monads are essentially patterns in functional programming languages. However, in C++, we do have some, uh, some functionality for functional literals and whatnot, so I thought Let's build a maybe monad. I'll explain what it is in a second. So essentially, we, uh, there is no uniform way of defining the presence of absence of uh, information. We, we have different ways of expressing the absence of a value. So uh, one thing is uh, you could just let it go. You, you make a string, and you can't really tell if it's been initialized or not, because well, there is no such thing as a null string. It's just an empty string. If you check its contents, it's an empty string, but it's not going to you know, throw an exception or anything. Another option is to have an LPTR. Another option is uh, to have some shared PTR which hasn't been initialized to anything. Another option, maybe a more idiomatic option, is to use boost optional or, I don't know, is it STD optional yet? Maybe not yet, but uh, might, may end up at some point. Anyways, we have lots of options. What we really want uh, to have is some sort of interface. And once again, I'm thinking of fluent interfaces, just like with a builder, some sort of interface for uh, having all those things uh, so that we can do a chain call, which, for example, drills into the structure of an object. So uh, I'll just skip this part. So uh, this, this is a very contrived example. It's deliberately con contrived because maybe you wouldn't write something like this in real life, but I'm using pointers to indicate absence. So if it's no PDR, we don't have that information. We suddenly don't want to cause an exception or something like that. So uh, what happens if we want to print the house name? So uh, I, I'm an ordinary developer, but if I was like a rock star and I bought a castle in the Scottish Highlands, I probably wouldn't have the address 123 London Road. I would have my own castle with a name. So some people would have a house name, other people would not. But in order to print that house name, you would have to go through this endless checks of basically checking whether the information is there. And I'm deliberately kind of exaggerating the problem here with 
now pointers. I guess if you had strings and chat PTRs, it would be a bit more tolerable, but but still still dangerous. So essentially, uh, I don't want to write uh, this this entire uh, if, especially if it's longer. Uh, actually, if if you're wondering where this kind of code is used, imagine that you're doing a refactoring on the code, and you have to. Like, you have to check that you're in a class. If you're in a class, you have to check the right visibility. If you're in the right visibility, you have to check that there is a constructor. You go into the constructor, you have to check, and so on and so on. So it's, it's the similar idea of checking the presence or absence of something in a massive chain. So I, I do actually use this code in real life. And the maybe monad basically tells you that we're going to abstract the idea of drilling down. So you're drilling down into person, then address, then house name. We're going to encapsulate that in a uh, chain call. So uh, we'll use a uh, separate object called maybe t, which is going to keep the context. That's where we are in that navigation chain. So the context is a pointer to where we are. We could be in person or in an address or in name. And uh, wh while the context is not null and we have something valid to work with, we drill down. But as soon as something turns null, uh, the entire chain becomes, becomes effectively a knob. And by no op, I don't mean that we don't call the functions. We suddenly call the functions. We just don't do anything on the data because it's no PDR. We, do, we can't touch it. So uh, the idea here is uh, to, to get this to work using lambdas. So I have a maybe, which is just a pointer to some context. But <laughs> one of the annoying things, waiting for them to fix it, is that you can't do a, uh, uh, you can't construct a maybe from a person pointer like a new maybe of p. That, that's why the, the extra kind of global functions for uh, doing almost nothing, but uh, very annoying. So anyway, so far, what I can do is I can construct this maybe of a person pointer. And that just initializes the context variable. There's nothing else that's, that's happening. We make a maybe of t and we initialize it. So then we want to drill down into the person. We want to uh, define some function. I'm calling it with here. And basically, you feed uh, this function, gets fed another function, which does the drilling down. So the evaluator here is a function which goes into the object and does whatever it wants to do, so long as it returns something, so long as it returns the context. So if we're in a valid state, if the context is not no PTR, what we can do is we can construct a new maybe where the context is evaluated from whoever fed us the lambda. Otherwise, we just do a no PTR. So, so far we get something like this. So, uh, we are drilling down into person, then person address, then person house name, but we're doing it in a completely safe way. Because if at any point uh, we hit an null pointer, uh, the context is going to be an LPTR. And the rest of the invocation chain is going to be an LPTR as well. So, the last thing that we can do is we can just print whatever is left. And for that, we, we can do a do, for example. So, so, so long as the context is not now PTR, we just print do, do whatever the action was provided. And there is no context tr transition here, because we're not drilling down. So we can just return the object we're in. And so if you do a print house name with a now PTR, for example, uh, the context is now from the outset and nothing happens. Uh, if you do a person and then print house name, then the context is uh, person, but since its address is null, it, it, everything becomes a knob once again. But if you actually initialize every single construct, a, you are actually going to get to the end, and you'll print the name of your castle. So, uh, I mean, this example is not specific to null PTR. You can replace it with some other constructs. Uh, with default initialized types are harder, like if you had a string, how do you know if the string is missing or just empty? Uh, but methods are difficult due to the fact that you have to have a bit more ceremony than in other languages, certainly in C Sharp or Kotlin or Rust. There are, there are magic shortcuts for writing those things shorter, but it is possible. It is possible to build a functional design pattern, effectively. So that's pretty much it. If you want to see some of the stuff in action, uh, the, I have a couple of C++ courses on Pluralsight. That's a site with videos on C++. I might write, put this together in a book once I get all the patterns. Uh, I kind of have to because I'm doing courses on every single design pattern, every single gang of four pattern, maybe some of the other ones as well. Uh, uh, hate mail can be directed to this address and is my Twitter handle as well. So that's it. Thank you.
No questions? Excellent. Okay, well, I'll, I'll be around, so if you have any ideas. Uh, okay. Yep. Like uh, what I have found to be kind of a more general and a safer way to do that is to write a like a range adapter function, like maybe like value to range or something. It, it's so the value would return a range that has a begin and end. So okay. Okay, so, so the, the comment was that it might be worth doing a range adapter as opposed to having the begin and end. And, and I agree. In, in fact, the, the, my, my kind of motivation was that I didn't want to spawn any objects, any more objects than, uh, than is necessary, but I, I, do re I do recognize this risk. It, it, is a, it is a viable risk. All right, well, thank you, everyone.